Hi everybody, today we're going to take a little tour of what I call the really, really big organ. You can see it's almost as tall as me and it's about seven feet wide. Um, here's a picture of the front side. At any rate, uh, I work for a company, an international company called Global Organ Group in the United States. We sell both Rogers and Johannes instruments and uh, my boss, business partner, uh, down in Los Angeles. We represent the Southern California area. I take care of the Central Valley here. And uh, he took this in trade and uh, decided it's you know old enough now that he kind of didn't want to do the repair work on it. Uh, and he ended up just passing it along to me. And this is my 20th organ that I have taken in and done some work on and had it in my possession for at least a little while. This will probably be a good long while I'll have this one. Uh, and at uh, any rate, um, all of these instruments that I take in usually are designed for a different situation than what I'm in, and so they always require some kind of modification. Now, to tell you the truth, even instruments that I've taken in that were designed for home use, uh, like the Hammond Colonnade, or I also have a Hammond Model A, those still get certain kinds of modifications because, well, I like to do unusual things with the organ. I like to do ambient music. I like to use them in my recording studio and, and all of these kinds of things. So in order to do that, I'm having to take something designed for one purpose and repurpose it for another. Now, to do most of that, I kind of have to have a basic understanding of electronics and electricity, and I'm gonna kind of talk about the basics of that as we go through this little tour. Um, this instrument was actually originally built as a showpiece uh, for the Johannes Company for the 1997 NAM show. It appeared there, and then after that, it was sold to a large church. So let's kind of take a look through what we're doing here. So um, it's any organ, whether it's a pipe organ or an electronic organ, it has electricity in it somewhere. So right here, this is the power cord that comes in for uh, uh, off the house current, which is uh, nominally at 110 volts. Well, all of the electronics in here don't use 110 volts. Uh, the computer uses 5 volts, the keyboard stop controls, those use 12 volts, uh, the amplifiers, those need plus and minus 35 volts, so how do we get all of that? Well, we start with transformers, and that's these three pieces down here. So transformers can alter the voltage of alternating current. Now, in alternating current, you have two lines. One's pushing while the other's pulling, and they're going back and forth like this. All right. Now, if you look at like a power pole and behind your house or whatever, you'll see a big canister looking transformer. In the case of my house, uh, this neighborhood, I think it's 20,000 volts comes in, and then that breaks it down to 220,110 uh, current for coming in the house. Well, we're doing the same thing on a much smaller scale to get all of the different voltages we need to run the organ. Now, the most fundamental thing about any electrical device, uh, whether it's a computer processor or a sound generator or an amplifier or your blender. Electricity has to make a circuit. It has to have a hot side coming in, it has to have a load that it passes through, and then it has to return back to source. In the case of electrical systems in the United States, we use a grounded system, and so we talk a lot about how we have the hot line and the ground line. And similar language is used in our um, uh, electronic stuff here. Now, we've got our line voltage coming in, it's alternating current, and we transform it down, and we've now got all the various voltages we need, but they're still alternating current. 
and what we need is DC, direct current, where the electrons are flowing in one direction all the time. So in that case, we don't talk about hot and neutral, we talk about positive and negative, or source and ground. So to convert the AC current to DC current and maintain our correct voltages, we have a number of power supplies. And there's power supplies here to run the central processor unit and to run the stop controls and the keyboards. And then there's power supplies on each of these racks, which is really where we get to the heart of this instrument. Now this instrument uses these three racks. The upper part of the rack, these are all the voice cards. This instrument is a sample playback instrument. Inside the memory of all of these voice cards are samples, are little recordings of actual organ pipes. And when I play keys and select stops, the central processor here sends out a command over to the voice cards and tells it which of those samples to start playing for us to hear. Then those go out to all of these amplifiers in here, and from there it goes to this output here. Turn this around. And these are all speaker outlets. Now, here's where we get into the major problem for converting this instrument into something I can use here in the studio. This organ has 30, yes, three, zero, 30 audio channels, all internally amplified. There's 30 amplifiers running 30 speaker outlets. Now, I don't have room for 30 speakers, but the bigger question is, why would you ever need 30 speakers? Well, let's remember. We're trying to imitate a pipe organ. So, a pipe organ has multiple ranks of pipes. There are thousands of pipes in a pipe organ. Each pipe is producing one note of one voice. So when you're in a big concert hall or a church and a big pipe organ is playing, you're hearing a lot of tone sources sounding all at once, and those sound waves are mixing in the air, and your ears pick it up as a blended sound. So why not just blend it electronically if you've got an electronic organ? Well, when you're trying to imitate a pipe organ, you want a lot of sound sources, especially in a big room. And this is also true of PA systems. So in a really good, well-designed electronic organ, you will have many, many, many audio channels that spread the sound out in the room the same way that different sets of pipes would be spread around the room to fill up the room with sound using the acoustic sound of pipes. Here we would have lots and lots of speakers spread out all over the place with maybe one part of the organ over here and another part of the organ over here, another part of the organ behind you, that kind of thing. So in an installation of an instrument like this, in a large space, we gotta have more audio channels, the better. And in this case, 30 were used to run this organ. Now, the room we're in right now is currently a shop space, but I'm slowly converting it into a studio space there's no way I can put 30 speakers in here. And in this smaller room, that wouldn't really be desirable. Another way to think about this multi-channel situation is if you go to an IMAX movie, uh, I think that's something like 20 or 30 channels to achieve the full surround sound that you get in an IMAX movie theater. But when you get the DVD, and you put it on your home theater setup, it's only five or seven channels. And that's simply because of the difference in the size of the space. You really couldn't do a 25 or 30 channel um, 
surround sound system in your living room. It just really wouldn't produce good results. It's the same thing here. And that is proving to be the biggest uh, challenge that I'm facing in trying to retrofit this organ to be for use in the studio here. And the first thing I need to do with this thing is to record all the music tracks for my show, Bach and Roll, The Unconventional Life of Virgil Fox, which is appearing uh, just a month from now uh, on the Edinburgh Fringe. So, I've got some things to do. Now, remember we talked about transformers and how they break down from the line current of you know, 110 volts down to the various voltages we needed, like 5 volts, 12 volts, 35 volts, whatever it happens to be for the electronics. And that we then need the power supplies to take those voltages and convert them into direct current from alternating current. Well, that comes into play here. Now, with a transformer, you're using coils that are in a ratio of maybe like 10 to 1 and that changes the, the voltage. So, looking at all of this, now obviously, somewhere along the line, between the voice cards and the amplifiers, there's what's called a line level audio signal. Now, you would be familiar with this, like on the back of a DVD player, there's the video out and then the two uh, lines for uh, audio out. Now, those audio signals are very low current, very low voltage, and they won't drive a speaker directly. That's the purpose of an amplifier. So that's why you have to take your DVD player and then plug it into your surround sound receiver before you get uh, any hearable audio. The same thing is done here. We have all of our audio outputs coming off of our voice cards and then they go down in here to the amplifiers and then they come out here on our speaker outputs. These old style 11 or 8 pin sockets. So how do I mix this down to the two channel stereo I need for using this to make recordings or monitoring at a reasonable uh, sound level. Well, I was looking at, the obvious thing to do would be to interrupt these audio signals uh, before they go into the amplifier. But just looking at the electronics in here, I wasn't confident that that was gonna give me a really good result. So, uh, the other possibility is to do the same thing that a transformer does on a much smaller scale. So, we can't just take a speaker outlet, which is a higher voltage, high current, to drive a speaker cone, and then plug it into a mixer. That's not going to work, right? But what we can do is we can attenuate the current coming off of the speaker outputs and then make convert them into the lower voltage, lower current uh, scenario we need to plug into a mixer and uh, in effect we're maintaining uh, the amplifier circuits but we're converting them from running speakers into running inputs of a mixer. And just like in a transformer where you have a pair of coils that uh, convert the voltage uh, down, in an attenuation circuit you have a voltage divider circuit and it kind of looks like this. So I have two resistors here. Uh, one is 10,000 ohms, one is 1,000 ohms. What's important about that is the ratio, 10 to 1. So if I take my speaker voltage and I come in here, I have my output going through a load and then returning. And that's what electricity wants to do. It wants to go through, so, through a load of some kind and return. So there's our complete circuit. Then 
because this is a 10 to 1 ratio, I can tap here halfway through and I get a voltage and current output that is one tenth of the total. And that takes speaker current, breaks it down to line level current, and then inserts it into a mixer. Now I made a Facebook post about doing this and a couple of my organ technician friends really didn't like that idea. And they said, look, there's gotta be some other way. Why can't you just tap into the audio? And the issue is, there's, there's two points on this. Number one, I don't know that this audio signal is really a complete audio signal. Does it have the expression control in the mix or not? Or is that handled at the amplifier level? If it's handled at the amplifier level, then I lose my expression pedals by tapping the audio here. Also, there's not a lot of room here where these audio output cards are. And so tapping this would be very difficult and challenging to do. They were convinced that there had to be a simpler and more elegant way to handle this need to mix down 30 channels to two. And uh, I contacted uh, after sales uh, at Johannes in the Netherlands. And uh, of course, they're nine hours ahead of us. So uh, uh, I sent an email off and then in the middle of the night, which was daytime for them, uh, they answered it back. And they sent me a complete set of schematics for this instrument. And yes, there is a simpler, more elegant way to tap the audio and have it at line level and run it into a mixer, which is what I need to do to use this organ the way I need to use it. So it turns out that these two plugs here are output and input, auxiliary out, auxiliary in. The, the thing I wasn't sure about was this says reverb extension. So is this just an output of the uh, external, of, of the internal reverb? So I'm not gonna really get a complete sound from the organ there, I'm just gonna get the reverb effect. Well, that's not really any value to me. The other thing was the way it was wired. That wasn't very obvious either. I have these three lines that come out of each of these audio cards and they say on the card reverb out so again that indicated that I wasn't going to get the complete sound of the organ I was just going to get the reverb effect then I'm looking at how this is wired here and it's wired in such a way that this is either a stereo signal or a mono signal using what's called a balanced line. And unfortunately, I don't have the test equipment necessary to determine that. So without the schematics and just looking at the situation, it wasn't obvious that I could use this for anything. But the folks at the Johannes factory sent me the schematics I was able to look at how everything was wired. And what I have is I have a stereo output for each sec of the three sections of the organ. Those come down here and then are blended to be a single stereo output for, and the reason it's marked external reverb is that normally that mixed signal would be used for you, uh, doing separate amplifiers and speakers for just the reverb in the room. But it, in actual fact, it's just the blended sound of each of the sections of the organ merged together. So it looks like right there, I can take, have uh, 
stereo mix for this part of the organ, stereo mix for this part of the organ, stereo mix for the third part of the organ. I can then put it into a mixer, have a headphone out, run it into my recording software, do whatever I need to do with it. And um, that's the first thing we're gonna try now. Down the road, I'm still, I'm still a believer in putting attenuation circuits on each of the speaker outlets, and this is why. It's easy to wire it on this instrument, and it doesn't interfere with the normal operation of the speaker system. So it's a modification that I can make that is non-invasive. I'm not altering anything. I'm adding something on in a passive way so that I can have both line level outputs for every audio channel or uh, speaker outputs for every audio channel. They can be used separately or together or in any combination you want. So if down the road I want certain audio channels to be on independent speakers for whatever reason, I can still do that. Um, if uh, I sell the instrument down the road, the buyer has the choice of having either a, a six channel audio out, a two channel audio out, a 30 channel audio out, or the normal speaker system for the instrument as designed. I haven't altered the organ in such a way that it would be difficult to undo. So I think for now, we're going to create a, a six channel output. We're going to see how that works. And uh, down the road, I'll also do the attenuation circuits because I don't see any reason not to. Now, all of this is having to get done pretty quick. Uh, I'm recording this on July 2nd. And uh, as of August the 6th or 7th, uh, my first performance of Bach and Roll, The Unconventional Life of Virgil Fox, is going to have to be online. So I don't have a lot of time to get all this done and get this organ in shape and get those uh, music tracks recorded. I do have a plan B and I'll do that if necessary, but uh, I'm really hoping to use this because let's face it, it looks really impressive and it probably makes a really nice sound. So that is our brief tour of the really, really big organ. And when we come back and visit this, hopefully it'll be all up and playing and uh, I can share the sound with you. Thanks a lot.